back to Psychedelics today. Joe Moore here, joined by Andrew Gallimore. How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good this morning. Thank you very much, Joe. Nice to be back yeah. on the show. It's been a bit. Um, a lot of things have developed. I think you were on pre-COVID um, with your previous oh, yeah. book, oh, yeah. Alien Information Theory. I'm trying to find it right now. I, it's the most frequently pulled off my shelf book to show people on camera, I think. <laughs> it's like, you have to check this out. Um, so, you know, before we get into the content, there's just this element of design and beauty in what you put out in these books. And not many people do that. I, I see it in kind of like the Western esoteric movement. Some UK publishers are doing that in psychedelics a little bit. Um, but I, nothing really to the level of what you did, which is like, you know, just so much graphic design and, and beautiful elements to help illustrate your points. Like, where where does that come from? And like, what what makes you want to put in that much work to do that? Uh, well, I, this, it's a number of things. Firstly, uh, I'm, a, I'm a control freak, basically. Uh, it's that I, the idea of giving up my work and saying, oh, okay, there it is, Found book number it. one. Yes. Um, that the yeah the idea of giving up my book, my work, my writing, and saying, "Oh, can you illustrate this for me?" Right. It's kind of, and and I I, I have my own vision, you know, for the mm -hmm. first book. I, I knew yeah. I wanted to produce this kind of eight bit, um, vintage kind of early computer graphics design. It kind of merges and with I, ayahuasca iconography a little bit or patterns. Yeah. Yeah. So I had this whole vision that goes along with the text, and I knew there was going to be lots of illustrations because of just the, just the nature of it. You know, you're describing complex neuroscientific concepts and other, you know, mathematical and other kind of abstract stuff. So I needed, knew I wanted a lot of images, and so, you know, I studied graphic design after my PhD actually in London for a year. So um, I knew you know, I've always loved graphic design. So it just made sense that I would take control and do, do the whole thing. Um, and, and the same with the second book as well. I wanted a specific um, ambiance, if you like, uh, to the book. I wanted to create this kind of um, clandestine um, cyberpunk kind of, it was um, somewhat inspired by kind of, 1990s Japanese anime um, like Akira, um, these kind of Japanese anime cyberpunk and that kind of style. I wanted to create the idea of this. Uh, this is yeah, this is the latest book of this rediscovered, unearthed manuscript, formerly hidden beneath the bowels of some clandestine, now defunct, allegedly defunct. Um, at reality engineering laboratory. That was kind of the vision I had. So that's kind of what I went with. And that's what I did. I tried to create that whole ambience throughout the book. You know, it takes a lot of work, though, having to, you know, to do that. You have to do every page, have to be hand distressed and, and, and work through. It was very tedious, actually. But I think it's worth it at the end because you, you, get, you get the feel that it is a unified. It's not just a text with illustrations it's a whole i see it as kind of a as a work of art really you know not to be um too pompous about it but i you know it is of course you when you write anything it, it's it's a work of art and when you you know produce design and graphics it's also so the whole thing is one piece of art basically it's not just about the text it's about the whole experience of reading the book yeah mm, i love it <laughs> I love it. It's going to give historians a hard time understanding the <laughs> culture and like, huh, this was from decades earlier, but it looks newer. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. That's fun. And yeah, if it, there's going to be listeners here that don't understand the distressed part, like um, kind of like uh, photocopies or Xerox is like the, uh, the image quality yeah. gets a little lower in like really interesting ways in certain parts. It's mm. fun. And I, yeah, I was just struck by the beauty. <laughs> so really, <laughs> Thank I you appreciate much. you yeah. uh, doing all that hard work. I know it's not easy. <laughs> Um, but it's really great. So, um, yeah, before we go too deeper, we're here today to talk about your book, uh, reality switch technologies. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And, um, psychedelics as tools for the discovery and exploration of new worlds is the full title, but there we go. Fun. Yeah. Um, and before we get into the book, let's get into you. Um, you've, uh, been in 
Okinawa for ages. Um, ostensibly doing research, or were you teaching? A little bit of both. Um, a bit, a little of both. Mainly research. I was in Okinawa. I'm now in Tokyo. Um, I was in Okinawa for almost seven years, uh, and yeah, I was a computational neurobiologist working at a university there, doing uh, basic research, studying um, low-level um, mechanisms in the brain, basically how. Uh, brain cells, neurons interact with each other, how they form connections, how memories are formed, um, that kind of thing. But now I've I, I, I moved to Tokyo earlier this year, so I'm I've abandoned or well, abandoned maybe the wrong word, but I've left left behind the academic world. I'm fully independent now. Mm, yeah, fantastic, and I'm really excited to see what you're up to after this. Um, we'll get into that later. So. Um, you've spent a lot of time doing this kind of basic research. So I think that probably gives you a lot of time to imagine and extrapolate from your basic research, what, what these larger things are, more complex entities, what happens when there's quadrillion of them hooked up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important that, I mean, with something like DMT, as I always say, it's not enough to be a, uh, you know, a psychologist or an anthropologist. You have to be a chemist. You have to be a pharmacologist. You have to be a neurobiologist. You have to be a little bit of a psychologist. You have to, and and also drawing on other um, traditions as well uh, and other disciplines. It, it's it's a it's it's very much an in, a multidisciplinary um, field. And if you if you if you are um, if you don't have that kind of scientific training, that scientific underpinning to it all, then your ideas, they can just fly off into the wind. You know, anything goes. Um, you can talk about the spirits of the plants or you can talk about the astral plane and you can draw from all of these mystical traditions or whatever to get your ideas. But you know, everyone has done that, you know, and it doesn't, to me, it's not, particularly satisfactory when I read these kind of things. Uh, I want someone to tell me, you know, if DMT really does gate access to these normally hidden dimensions of reality, how does that work? It's not enough to say, oh, maybe it's like changing the channel um, or maybe it's like, oh, it's, it's interfacing with the astral plane or it's the ancestors. You know, all of these are kind of good jumping off points, but that's never been satisfactory. They're not really substantive I, things, right? No, no, yeah. no. And, and, you know, anything could go. You can say anything there and you can justify it in some way. But I want to know, okay, how can we actually connect this to what goes on in the brain? Because clearly DMT, whatever you think it is, or its purpose, its origin, whether you believe it's, in, it's allowing us to interact with actual autonomous intelligent beings or not, it's clearly interfacing with the human brain. That's where it is. Uh, the initial interaction is with these receptors in, inside um, neurons on, on the surface of neurons. So um, that much is clear. So we start from there. We start from that the, that very basic uh, uh, underpinning, you know, physical really underpinning uh, of what DMT is doing, and then we go from there. From there, can we explain how DMT could be? if it is allowing us to interface with another reality filled with strange intelligent beings, how could that work? Um, so that's really what I try to focus on. I try to keep my foot, as I say, squarely, one foot squarely within the neuroscientific and scientific and pharmacological and chemical arena, uh, whilst reaching out uh, with the other, um, the other foot and the, the other limbs into some quite, unorthodox territory but i can always defend myself and say hey um you know i, I do substantiate everything that i'm saying with uh, quite a lot of of perfectly uh, reasonable and orthodox uh, neuroscience mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> kind of what you were saying earlier about you know being very multidisciplinary um kind of the uh I don't know, apex leaders of the field years and years ago were quite multidisciplinary, um, you know, from Tim Leary to Terrence McKenna and 
many, many more, um, very multidisciplinary. And, um, yeah. And I, I find that to be something lacking in our movement today in the psychedelic movement. And I would really like to bring that back. I, I've been calling it the, uh, Esalen vibe <laughs> a little bit because there was a lot right. of that going on, right? Like every scientist from every arena was listening to each other and curious. And there was some active friendly debate, sometimes unfriendly, probably, but you know, people were making a lot of progress and, uh, yeah, that's certainly true. You know, M Terrence McKenna, I mean, he was probably the most well-read person that I've ever had any, <laughs> you know, I've ever heard. I mean, it's incredible, his knowledge and the way that he was able to draw from all, you know, he was able to draw from philosophy and, you know, Jungian theory and, uh, alchemy and the hermetic traditions and uh, he could draw from everything uh, and and then kind of bring them together in his brain and and pre and produce something completely novel that you'd never heard before you know a completely new idea that you couldn't possibly have imagined right that's that's my ultimate aim i don't know if i've achieved that but i think that's really important if you just focus if you just say i'm just going to focus on the changes in the the EEG signature of, of, of psychedelics, or if you're just going to focus on uh, the low level drug receptor interactions, um, you miss, you see parts of the picture, but you're, you're not really able to produce anything wildly novel. So that there has to be people that straddle. You know, I, I'm not a, a world leading neuroscientist. I'm not a, a pioneer in chemical pharmacology, but what I do offer is I'm a jack of all trades, right? In a, in in a, in, a, in a sense, which is not a bad thing. I'm more of a generalist, which allows me to draw from all these different fields and and then produce something um, novel, produce new ideas, new new things for people to talk about, to discuss, and to argue about, complain mm. about. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to put it. Um, and yeah, and and I'm struck by um, hearing you kind of describe the future vision about, you know, just understanding kind of low level neurology, neuroscience at this level that you do, it, that allows you to kind of see from a really different lens. Like Terrence's was probably anthropology, butterfly collection, yeah. sci-fi, right? You know, everybody should be reading sci-fi. That's part of your homework, yes. everybody. But, yes. um yeah, it's it's just fascinating to see these jumps. So, kind of want to describe your first book to the folks here listening, or maybe before we do that, um, you you worked with uh, Dr. Rick Strassman to develop a paper. Um, was it developing the neuropharmacokinetic model for um, DMT long term administration of the IV? Was that it, or was it something different? Something like that. Yeah. So it was. So yeah. So it's originally my idea that you could use this technique from anesthesiology target controlled intravenous infusion uh, to basically maintain a stable DMT concentration in the brain over time so that you can bring someone into the DMT state and then hold them there by maintaining the DMT in the brain. Um, so that was the kind of the, the seed, if you like, of the idea. Uh, and then I worked with Rick Strassman using his blood data from the, the early 90s. So the, the blood concentration of DMT over time. Uh, from his subjects. Uh, and then I used that to develop a pharmacokinetic model, which is the metabolism, uh, how DMT is metabolized and distributed through the body and in the brain uh, over time. And then you use that to develop an infusion model. So how much DMT do you put into somebody's bloodstream uh, over time in order to maintain that? Uh, and it was really just a proof of principle. It was just to kind of show the scientific community and others that this was possible, that DMT did have the required pharmacological properties that would allow this um this technique to work and and that, that's now been borne out by the imperial team uh, and not and others as well actually uh, there's at least three groups two very academic groups and one less academic group uh, medicinal mindfulness as you know uh, in colorado um who have, have kind of picked up the mantle and actually starting to do this now in humans and the imperial team actually have just finished their the first study with a, a 30 minute infusion of dmt uh, which will be published well paper will be submitted i think towards the end of this year so 
in the next few weeks and then um well let's see how long it takes to actually get published but yeah um it's this this program dmt x as we uh, as we call we called it or extended state dmt is actually happening now so it's kind of amazing to see these little ideas from 2015 um just seven years ago actually um coming to fruition now we're starting to see the actual results coming out soon yeah i think i was at your uh, boulder colorado talk about this and i I actually have yes. a, a patch up on my wall, uh, the DMTX kind of NASA patch. Have I you have seen that, these yet? Yes. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Um, I just can't wait to get a jumpsuit so I can put it on, uh, my flight suit. That would be cool, yeah. Right? Just yeah, look, just I have like one NASA. made, like a NASA one, right? That kind mm-hmm. of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm into it. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so... <laughs> um, it, in that meantime, in that seven-year period before Imperial kind of started it and Daniel McQueen was able to execute or I think he's really close uh, with medicinal mindfulness. Like where have yeah. you, did you hear rumblings of people in the underground trying it at all? Cause like, I, I assume people of means would yeah. of course want to do that. Yeah. I, well, people have told me or they have posted, I've, you know, I, I occasionally scour the, is that the word? Maybe um, the, um, the online, kind of forums like DMT Nexus and various Reddit form and forums and um, or Reddit pages, whatever you call it. And, you know, the shroomery and that kind of thing. And there are people actually that claim to have done it, but whether I believe them or not, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not that straightforward. You have to, um, you have to obtain the, the infusion machine, which aren't expensive, but I'm not sure unless you're, you know, a clinician or something, how easy it is to just go ahead and order. I was seeing them on eBay, veterinary infusion pumps on eBay. uh, Really? For very low prices. Uh, I looked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Like a couple of hundred dollars or something. Yeah. You know, it's not an expensive thing to set up. It's not like setting up an MRI machine or something in your bedroom. This is, you know, it's a pump um, that, you know, has to control the speed at which it it moves the... um, the plunger on on the the syringe so it's it's not a complicated device it's like a big calculator with a with a with a pump attached to it really um so it's so yeah it's not going to be expensive but it's not recommended of course for people to do this because you really do need to know what you're doing you need to have very very pure dmt in the right form for injection the right concentration uh, and you need to be able to program the device properly um, you don't want to be pumping yourselves full of, you know, hundreds of milligrams of DMT uh, in a, in a, you know, in, in 30 minutes because, well, you might not come back. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's these, the thing. So, There's so yeah. much we don't know here. And that's why it's right, so exciting. Yeah. You know, I, mm. I'm always excited about risk takers because hopefully they'll come back with some exciting stories. But yeah, this isn't like, hey, this isn't safe necessarily. We're going to find out. Yeah. But um. Yeah, it's going to be really awesome data. I'm just it it is like the sci-fi future in a lot of ways. Um, um yeah, that's how I see it. I, I it, it to me it, it feels it's always felt a little bit sci-fi in a way in that you're 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 planning and basically a program of interdimensional citizenship. It feels like that. I mean Terence McKenna used to do the you know galactic citizenship. Um and we're, it's almost like we're, we're, we've leapfrogged over galactic citizenship and we're now doing straight to interdimensional, trans-dimensional citizenship, whatever you want to call it, um, where we're interfacing and communicating with an intelligence not of, not of this universe. I mean, that's kind of, that's a wild idea. Um, and, and we have the technology now. You know, this to me, this infusion technology, this is the way to do it um using dmt at least um it's not glass pipes um it's not um handheld little e- e-cigarettes i mean although i think they're excellent by the way um but you know the, the pinnacle of this technology you know our best tools that we can bring to the table is definitely this dmt this extended state infusion technology uh, and it's being done 
It's being not necessarily for interdimensional communication, of course. That is not on the grant proposal. I'm sure that Imperial College wrote. Um, but um, that's how I, that was my original vision, is that we are trying to establish communication with these being, beings, whatever they are and wherever uh, they are from. You might remember this phrase. Uh, I talked to somebody about your work a number of years back and they mm. said, that's, that's interesting though, gratuitously exotic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I got such a kick out of that. Um, <laughs> but I, I yeah, feel like I you're right. That. This yeah. is a real deal. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's in the, you know, 1700s, it was gratuitously exotic to do a lot of the exposition expeditions we were doing, you know, space right. has seen gratuitously exotic. So it is, course, you know, yeah. kind of a feature of uh, frontier thinking, I believe. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's get into alien information theory. Then we can jump into your new book. So alien information sure. theory, you laid out a really interesting frame where um, you you were conceiving the universe or existence as being kind of made up of information and, um, you know, at a certain scale, all sorts of random things happen in the universe and you get items of higher and higher orders of complexity and there could be things wildly more complex than us um, out there um, that are kind of abstracted at different levels of reality. This is my recollection. Um, but, yes. you know, what what am I missing here from the explanation of your book um, from a high level? <laughs> Probably quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, the book was kind of my vision of based upon 20 years of, of thinking and writing and researching about DMT, uh, it was kind of my vision of reality. And as you say, the idea that the universe is fundamentally emergent and emerges from this very low level, fundamental digital code, these digital patterns that self-organize uh, and self-complexify and then form hierarchies of complexification. So you can imagine from the ground of reality, um, these very simple um fundamental units of reality, which are basically just digits um, in pure information, basically. This complexifies and forms these patterns that we would recognize as fundamental particles. Um, and from there, you can then invoke standard physics. These fundamental particles then self-organize to form these structures we call atoms, which then self-organize. Uh, and then you get self-organization that generates cells, right, living cells. Uh, which, which self-organize from proteins and minerals and carbohydrates. And then cells, we know, they self-organize to form multicellular organisms. So we sit at the top of this hierarchy of, uh, this hierarchy of, of complexity. And, and DMT is a, uh, a tool um, that, is it's basically a, a small piece of code it's a small piece of uh software really um at, uh, when you get down to it that allows the brain that alters the, the 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 patterns of information being generated by the brain which ultimately results in uh, a kind of a gating of information from um, higher dimensions of this larger structure so the idea is that our reality actually emerges as a slice a, a lower dimensional slice of this much higher dimensional structure so you can think of stacks of chess boards for example um, each chess board is a two-dimensional grid uh, and you can kind of play a game on that if you like uh, and but then you could also think about well what if we played the game in three dimensions and that uh, people have done this right um you can you know you can start receiving information from the, the squares above and below as well as the squares immediately around you and then you get uh, you know you start to get high dimensional uh, emergence of uh, the emergence of high dimensional structure because information is being received from these high dimensions and so when you take dmt uh, as this model goes what's happening is that your brain is beginning to receive information from these orthogonal dimensions you're starting to um, effectively temporarily become part of this high dimensional structure your brain becomes this high dimensional structure within this 
uh, high dimensional space and thus you can interact with the larger structure of, of, of which we are simply a low dimensional slice and this is where you encounter these beings that are far more complex um, and far more intelligent and know a lot more they have the purview over our lower dimensional slice <laughs> and you've had experiences of, of these entities right this is wildly common in the literature right it's like uh one of the first things you hear about when people start talking about dmt yes i mean um obviously if you go back to indigenous traditions um you know ayahuasca is the obvious one obviously entities there the, the spirits that the people meet and converse with and interact with uh, always there uh, but but it's not just that from the very first studies of purified dmt in the west in humans in the 1950s um, the very first subjects were describing uh, entities uh, they were describing gods they were describing spirits they were even describing elves or elf like small um, elf-like beings that move around very, very quickly. This is from the very first studies with Stephen Zara, the Hungarian physician who discovered DMT, or at least discovered its psychedelic properties. Um, so it seems to be an inherent, intrinsic part of the experience is that if, if you go into the DMT realm, you are it is likely to be uh, populated and you are likely to have at least observe but more than likely actually able to interact with a variety of rather curious uh, beings mm. um yeah it's fascinating and um I, lo I love it as a cosmo conception it's uh in in that game I, what was the the game that was modeling these things like the um the game of life thank you yes yeah, um, so that's Conway's game of life. Yeah, so this is yeah. So that's basic. I used a lot of uh, these are called cellular automata, which is when you have a, a, a square grid. Each square can be either in a, a a black state or a white state. You know, on or off, dead or alive, zero or one. Doesn't really matter. It's a binary system, uh, and and the each square can update its state depending upon the states of its neighbors. And you, you only need like four very simple rules, um, which John Conway discovered. Uh, and you start these very, very curious emergent structures start to appear on the board. You get creatures that will kind of scuttle across the grid. You, you get these spaceships that form that fire projectiles. Um, so all of this, this is this. It's not true life, of course, what you're observing on this simple you know the game of life as he calls it um, but what you are seeing here uh, it, it's hinting it's suggesting that you can start with very simple rules and you can get completely unpredicted uh, complexity um, and so imagine then that happening at the fundamental level of our reality with very simple um, basic units of information you know fundamental units of reality digits that can exist in you know is it you know perhaps one of two states at the time or maybe it's three states or four states or five states we don't really know it's not that important um, but you can imagine um, that this can self-complexify and self-organize and that all of the rich patterns and complexity that we see in our universe could have emerged uh, from this very very simple code at the ground of our reality and there are you know there are some serious physicists that take this quite seriously you know Stephen Wolfram is a is a great proponent of this and he's actually looking for the rules you know what are the fundamental rules they're probably very simple you can probably write them on the on, on a postcard uh, these rules are um, and you know it, it's, it's a whole area of physics called digital physics or digital philosophy which was really pioneered by a computer uh, mit computer science scientist called ed fredkin i don't know if he's still alive but uh, he was he, he was a great inspiration as, as well because he he spoke about um, not just our universe uh, but he, he also thought about where is this you know if, if the universe is some kind of emergent from some kind of fundamental computer code where is it being running from is there some other place which he simply called other um which is kind of mm, i like that idea that there's this this 
other place that we can't access that is running our code and and that um that inspired uh, a lot of the work in in alien information theory because i was thinking about what is the relationship between you know if, if our reality did emerge from a simple rule set um are we in fact part of you know are there is there are there countless numbers of these universes within this high dimensional structure each with their own rule set um, somewhere complex emergent living organisms uh, emerge and, and ones where they don't um, and how do they interact with each other and how do, and who, who, who wrote the rules if you like uh, that kind of thing I um, I know the name Wolfram because I, I spent uh, a bit of time in computer land and uh, you know one of the smartest people I've ever encountered uh, oh yeah yeah you know, oh yeah he does, he's not afraid to tell you either yeah. <laughs> I mean <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he mentions it on every page of his books. You know how smart he is, and um, yeah. I mean, he is. I mean, I'm not going to take it away from him, but you know, a bit of humility sometimes. (laughs) It's actually pragmatic uh, to have some humility. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So um, great. So let's let's jump to the next book. I think that was amazing, and thank you for that rundown. Um, So, reality switch. Um, which I think, I think there's going to be some really interesting, uh, groups forming after they read this book (laughs) (laughs) to, uh, I I think there might be some interesting, uh, explorers clubs developing. Um, but that would be cool. Yeah. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if you did it with, uh, um, alien information theory as well, but (laughs) I think they're out there. They should just tell you about it if they're doing it. (laughs) Yeah, I think alien. Inf- I'd be more concerned if people were forming kind of uh, experimental groups after alien information theory, simply because it does involve, um, you know, these kind of infusion stuff, which I don't recommend people do on their own. Uh, but reality switch technologies is is more grounded in, in that it's it's not it's not just some far out speculative metaphysics like really alien information theory was. Um, what I really wanted to do originally was to write a book that explained, because I've noticed, you know, I've read many books on psychedelics, all of the major ones, um, but what didn't exist uh, until I wrote it was a really detailed, comprehensive guide to how do psychedelics work in the brain from, you know, at all levels of organization, from drug receptor interactions to effects on neurons to effects on cortical activity to the you know how does this translate into the experience um there are lots of very technical academic books which will get, go into great detail about binding constants and really largely uninteresting and well at least irrelevant stuff for most people um and there's some kind of high level stuff you know michael pollan um obviously wrote that book, I forget its name. No, I don't. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, whatever it was called, Underst- something. How to mind. change your mind? Know. How to change your mind? Yeah, and that was obviously wildly popular. Um, and there have been many other books throughout the years, going back to the nineties and stuff, uh, and and earlier, um, talking about psychedelic. But no, nothing really that satisfied me was giving a really detailed comprehensive and deep explanation for what psychedelics were doing in the brain so i knew i needed to fill that that was my kind of job that was my role uh, was to fill that gap and produce a book where anybody who was really interested could pick it up and and develop a really satisfying understanding of what psychedelics are doing in the brain you know all the psychedelics as well all the all the major classes so the, the classic psychedelics like lsd psilocybin dmt uh, as well as ketamine you know a dissociative psychedelic or pcp or what about the tropane alkaloid like mandrake or datura um, or salvia of course so those are the kind of the four major categories of psychedelic which i cover in the book and i i, I unify it all together uh, this the, under under a, a kind of a coherent framework, um, so that you you spend the first few chapters of the book looking at the fundamental neuro neurobiological and chemical pharmacological underpinnings, uh, and then the, the 
the neuroscience of how your brain constructs your reality. Uh, and then we get into, OK, now what happens when we perturb this world building system of your brain uh, with these molecules? Why, uh, when LSD enters the brain, interacts with this particular receptor, why does this change the way that the neuron, what are the signaling pathways? Why does it change the way the neuron behaves? How does that then change the way that neurons communicate with each other? And how does this then change the way that your world appears? You know, why, how does this generate at the end, ultimately, this psychedelic effect? And why is it different with different psychedelics? And why do different psychedelics have different mechanisms? Um, so, yeah, I think that, I think I pretty much achieved that um, uh, with this book, Reality Switch technologies mm. i remember the, in the first or second section there was a beautiful diagram with all the switches <laughs> and circuitry yes yes um, yeah so that's that's the beginning of the book so I, I i frame it in terms of for um channel switches i call them and it, but it's, it's not just like like a light switch we're talking about a drug receptor interaction which then causes a change in subcellular signaling which will all be made clear if you read the book uh, which then alters you know uh, the way that a neuron uh, functions and behaves and interacts with other neurons so it's a whole mechanism at le several le levels of organization which which ultimately can change switch um you know terence mckenna called dmt the reality channel switch you know that's what it's doing it's switching the brain from constructing one model of reality one world model to constructing an entirely different world model so it makes sense to me that you would call it uh, some kind of switch so these are the four main switches and yeah there's an overall kind of diagram at the beginning of the book which is kind of cool uh, which shows you basically everything so at the end of the the book that diagram you see at the beginning you should uh, understand what actually all those little pieces are all the connectivity all the wiring uh, actually uh, actually means yeah and then at the end of the book i start to look towards the future the la the last chapter is really the it's the only highly speculative because it's looking into the future and saying can we you know what are we going to do now we have these molecules that we can use to manipulate the brain's uh, reality channel so I, I call it the world space so each the world that you experience is this pattern of neural activity uh, a pattern of information generated by your brain uh, and there are a uh, a there is a vast and extremely vast number of possible states a number of possible worlds if you like that your brain can construct um, basically all the permutations of the patterns of activity of your brain form this large state space which I call the world space and what psychedelics are doing is allowing you to access different regions within this uh, world space landscape so we normally occupy a very small district within this world space landscape which is experienced as the states of the normal waking world the consensus world which is a model of the environment and psychedelics allow the brain for reasons which are discussed in great detail in the book to access other regions you know it could be regions just outside our kind of consensus reality space like with a low dose of mushrooms or something or you could be kind of teleported almost to a completely different area of this world space landscape as you get with you know, a high dose of DMT, where there's you, you enter a world that is completely disjoint, has no relationship to the normal waking world. Um, and so you start to see this picture where you have this vast number of worlds, this vast world space that the human brain could uh, experience. And so that becomes your playground then. And you say, OK, can we design molecules that can actually direct a vector uh, into different regions of this world space, if we understand it fully, um, do we even have to use molecules to do, to do that? Are there other ways that we can activate these receptors without having to introduce exogenous molecules into the bloodstream? And I talk about that as well. The idea of using uh, magneto receptors, uh, which are basically genetically engineered receptors that are attached to um, uh, super paramagnetic beads which means that when you apply a, a, a high field magnet so you put on a magnetic helmet basically and switch it on 
um, you're instantaneously activating these particular receptors in, in the correct manner, uh, which will instantaneously transport you uh, into that other space. So you can you can imagine <laughs> having systems, you know, of these receptors within your brain set up, and they would be completely inactive until you put on this helmet and you you dialed in um, the right can. You know, electromagnetic configuration such that you would then be transported to any de desired location within this vast world space i mean that's you know it's, it's a wild idea but it's 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 not beyond the realms of possibility we already have magnetoreceptors working in animals you can manipulate the behavior of rats for example by implanting these magneto receptors into their brain and you can you can uh, manipulate their behavior whether you know, whether they can find an object or not find an object whether they turn left or turn right um just by applying these magnets so it's it's the technology is getting there um when we <laughs> chatted i think it was uh last week maybe I shared with you yeah. the Terence McKenna line, uh, drugs of the future will be computers and computers of the future will mm. be drugs. And, you know, in a, in a way we're seeing um, technologies really manipulating psyche, you know, regardless of how far and, you know, how exact we are. Um, there's still some really interesting stuff happening there. So I'm hopeful it's going to keep getting more sophisticated and uh, some people are going to really stumble onto some stuff. I was, I was at this conference in Miami recently and, only for speakers <laughs> did this group have a uh, table set up out back that people were raving about um, uh, the experience. Uh, it was very visual, very, very immersive. So I, I, you know, imagine what that looks like in five years if, uh, if someone throws a bunch of money at it, right? It's uh, going to be really interesting. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I, I, we, we are, we are, we're, we're just at the beginning now and you can you can think you take virtual reality technology and the way that that is progressing you then you add in artificial intelligence into the mix and then you add in pharmacology and neuropharmacology chemical pharmacology and other neural manipulation systems and you you begin to realize that our brain is this uh, this tool uh, this world building machine uh, that we can learn to tune uh, to access other worlds. You know, it doesn't mean that these worlds are, when I say a world, I mean an experienced world. I don't necessarily mean a world that is mapped to some external reality necessarily. I'm not making an, an ontological judgment as to whether these worlds actually are mapped to some kind of other environment, some other dimension. But but certainly we can access other experienced worlds. If you, if you take DMT, you will go to another world. Now we can argue or debate about the ontology of that world. Uh, where is it? Is, does it come from um, deep within uh, our psyche or something? Is it part of you know, collective unconscious structures? Is, or is it some other dimension these are great questions uh, but the fact that we can access these worlds that our brain can model them which is the key point uh, is incontestable uh, and that in itself is amazing because it allows us then to, to to have this vastly expanded playground um within which to to to, to discover and explore these astonishingly bizarre and strange worlds that we could never even have conceived of so i think that in itself you know that's virtual reality plus you know 6.0 or something i don't know which number it would be but where you are you are not just using visual data through the eyes uh, to generate these worlds but you're actually allowing the brain stimulating the brain perturbing the brain such that it begins constructing these worlds um of its own accord now that is it's kind of mind-blowing to think about it but we're, we're getting there <laughs> so your I, mind has been blown joe <laughs> I, I was just thinking about all the arguments on twitter recently about uh you know <laughs> the ontology of entities and you know, your, your phrasing is so precise that it's, you know, how are people actually arguing this, right? It's there. 
it's a, it's a world experience, right? It's, it's, you know, we can't even speak about the ontology yet because, yeah, know. exactly. I think it's at this point, I mean, the reason people argue with me, um, is, well, there's, there's, there's a number of different reasons, but often they don't understand, uh, what I mean. Um, uh, they, they have either haven't read what I've written, um, or they've just read a few Twitter posts. Um, that's one option or they're from the mystical or new age kind of community uh, and they have a very particular idea they know what these entities are it's the spirit plane you know they, they, these are spirits obviously right these are the plant spirits they and, and that's that's the kind of it's settled you know for them that's fine but i'm not interested in <laughs> discussing with them because i'm not of the camp uh, I, I mean, I, I don't sit in either camp. Uh, I don't sit with the 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 orthodox neuroscientists who either say they are just hallucination, they're not real, whatever that means. They never define what they mean by real, first of all, but they say they're not real, or I don't care if they're real. You know, I read that, I wouldn't say who from, but a friend of mine said, uh, you know, even if, you know, who cares if they're real? You know, as long as as long as they're they're meaningful to you and they're helpful and whatever, which is nice. It's an it's a nice attitude to an extent. Uh, but there are people that, uh, including me, that do care actually whether they are real. Um, you know, are we really communicating with a an autonomous, um, self reflective creature, being, intelligence? That has its uh, that exists from its own side. Right. That to me is the fundamental question here. Is there something it's like to be a machine elf? Uh, is the question. Um, yeah. What's the lived experience the machine, of is, a machine is elf? Is the machine? Yeah. Exactly. Is is the machine elf just as unable to deny its own existence as we are unable to deny ours? The only thing that we cannot deny, each of us individually. Uh, is our own consciousness. That's the only thing that's, that goes right back to Descartes. Um, so that is the only thing we can't deny. And, and yet we think of ourselves as being real. We don't deny our own existence. We don't, we don't debate one. Well, most people anyway, some, I guess, do. Uh, we don't, each of us individually doesn't debate our own ontology. We, we, we know we are real. We know that we are uh, conscious. Um, so, you know, is the machine elf or one of these other beings that we are communicating with, are they in the same position? Uh, and if so, who are we to deny their ontology uh, or, you know, or to deny or confirm their ontological status? Um, which, <laughs> um, and I don't think we are in that position. So we need to be like about very the experience humble. of others, right, too. It's, oh, you had this experience. How can you have any say in the experience of somebody else and uh right exactly exactly the ontology so, part. yeah so I, I sit between i i have no i have little time for ideologues of any uh, of any field or persuasion uh, and there are a lot of those in recent years i dare say um yeah, and I, i'm seeing it more and more people are taking a very firm position one side or, or the other I don't think it's particularly helpful. I don't think we know enough. We have to go in there with an open mind, explore the space, establish communication, uh, and and then think about what we do with that. You know, what as, as Terence Terence McGinnis has said, you know, what are we to do with an elf? Uh, this is the basic question. What are we to do with an elf? Uh, what do what do we think about it? What do we think about its its ontology? How seriously do we take it? Do we try and experiment and test its ontology by giving it mathematical problems to solve? Um, do we just try to uh, extract information and learn from it and then forget about whether or not it's conscious or otherwise? Uh, are we interested in where it's from? Did it, did it emerge from deep unconscious structures, which is one possibility, these kind of autonomous psychic complexes, which Jung wrote about decades ago? Um, or did, the, did it emerge, in fact, within some hidden dimension of reality, some other space to which we normally have no access? These are all, in my opinion, completely open questions at this point. We don't know. 
the answers. Maybe they are plant spirits. Um, I don't know. Mm. So I was listening to a um, kind of Western esotericism podcast the other day talking about, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, spirit summoning, all this kind of thing. And people have experiences, right? What are those experiences? But then, you know, uh, in the UK, this whole chaos magic thing came up, I think, as part of the punk rock era, and people started conjuring Santa Claus, Peter Pan, <laughs> etc. And it's like, w these things have some sort of anchoring in the human psyche, right, and, and show up in interesting ways and can be interactive. And, um, you know, these folks were saying something along the lines of, you know, yeah, I, I guess I would accept it if somebody could prove to me that this was all a product of my psyche, my brain, purely. But I don't, I don't know that it would matter much. I would still be interested in interacting in these things. And I, it's, um, you know, I, I think there is some interesting value if it's outside the brain, but, um, you know, so that's why we have to experiment and research and figure it out. I think, and, yeah, I mean, it would be, it would be, uh, reality shattering. Uh, it, it would, it would uproot all of our fundamental ontological assumptions or, or it, it would be, the most, I would say, the most profound discovery in, in, in human history, if, if we discovered that we were able to interact with an intelligence that was not of this universe. I mean, that would be, you know, it's a wild idea, but we, sh we, sh we shouldn't rule it out because the, the implications of it being correct, um, you know, if that was possible, and there's, there's nothing to really rule it out. Um, so if, if it is true that it and it is possible uh, then how would we ever know if we just assume that we're not you know you're faced with these beings they're right in front of your fucking face and they're telling you you know that uh, that they are the the programmers of our reality and that kind of thing and they're showing you things that you that are so impossibly complex that you could never have even imagined or conceived of and you see that and, and, and you, go, you go, you kind of come back and go, ah, oh, well, I know it's all just a hallucination. So, you know, it's like, what the fuck do we need to do? You know, <laughs> like what, what, like seriously, what would they need to do to, con you know, what do I need to convince you? You know, what do I need to show you? Just tell me, you know, often if you tell them, you know, what can you show me? They will can show you. Uh, I've done that before. I made that mistake. You know, what can you show me? Give give me all you've got. I think that's what I said to this being once. Um, I don't remember what happened after that, but it, it, it it's shattered, you know, it, it, it shattered me to the very core of my being. Uh, I knew I'd seen, you know, so, so they are, they do seem to be interested. They enjoy, many of them anyway, communicating with them, communicating with us. Um, so, so yeah, why, sh it just seems so stupid uh, and so arrogant, almost, and anthropocentric that oh, we know, you know, we have this lossless access to the true basis of reality. Uh, we can explain it all. Um, they, therefore, these we, these beings, these hyperdimensional, bizarre alien realities, it's all just a product of our brain gone haywire or our brain on drugs. Um, and I've never been satisfied with that. I find that deeply unsatisfying. And that's why I've been studying and thinking and writing about dmt for the last 20 years is because because it does it, it's there's no other experience that, that's so in your face that says okay here it is it's right here you don't have to imagine it it doesn't fall out of the field equations um you know um that you, you know you don't have to set up um detectors uh, deep underground that could detect you know, a 10 millionth of a millimeter shift in this needle. Um, it's right there. You know, it's right there, right in front of you. You know, one toke away, one good lung fall away of DMT, and you are there. My God, um, how stupid do you have to be uh, to just brush that off and say, ah, you know, it's, it's obviously just a hallucination. It's obviously just your brain making it up. I don't think we're in any position to make any kind of assumption like that and we must explore this space we must assume that we don't know what we're dealing with and going there with a completely open mind and say what can you tell us what can you show us 
can we explore this place? What can we discover within this space? Then we can begin to piece together, perhaps someday, some kind of uh, explanation for what it is we're dealing with. Mm. Um, so th there's something about this um, sense of it being real that um, people often report it's the DMT experience feels more real than their lived experience of their day-to-day -day life even. So yeah. is there anything in your kind of neurological uh, neuroscience understanding of how the brain works about this sense of reality as it relates maybe to the DMT experience? Or is that, is that too um, maybe far out in the future for neuroscience even? Uh, well, I think certainly, I mean, the, at, a, at a very high level, we know the brain is very good generally at, distinguishing between what's real and what is um, not real, but not always. You know, when you're dreaming, for example, your brain is constructing a, a model of the world in, in, in very similar ways that it does during waking, in fact, and you're not aware uh, of it being not real. Uh, and we know that it's partly to do with your, your frontal cortex. Your frontal cortex, this um, executive part of your brain that is always reality testing, it's always checking that things are making sense. And so it, and this actually shuts down um, or it, it's deactivated to a large extent when you're dreaming. So all these weird things can happen. Your, your, your friend can kind of morph into another person or you, the scene can shift from the inside of an airport to uh, the back garden or, you know, or to another country. And things can shift and change. Uh, and, and yet you never go, wait a minute, this is fucking weird. This can't happen. You never do that in dreaming, uh, or very rarely, unless you're a lucid dreamer. Uh, and what lucid dreamers do is, is, that, is they're able to kind of reactivate to some extent this frontal part of the brain. Um, so you can think, you know, is this, could this happen? Um, um, you know, try and switch on the lights. That's the one. Did you see that film movie, Waking Life, a long time ago, animated one? Oh, yeah. Um, Some Alex Jones but, action yeah, that, there, right? Yeah, that's a, a good trick. A good trick is to... Um, switch on the light you know, every, throughout your day as you walk past the light switch just check it's working you do that enough you'll start doing it in your dreams <laughs> and then in your dream when you switch the light switch and nothing happens sometimes then you know ah, this is a dream um, so so yeah so so humans are to some extent quite good at reality testing um, uh, now obviously like psychotics for example will often lose that insight. Um, so they will lose the insight. They will hear voices. They will see being, they will interact. They will have these, these, these delusions uh, and, and hallucinations, which they won't, they won't have insight into. They won't recognize as being uh, not real. However, when a psychotic recovers, they will accept, oh, that voice was just, you know, some part of my brain speaking to another or something like this, you know, that the being that was infecting my blood wasn't really there. I was just ill, right? Same with the dream. When you wake up from a dream, you're not thinking, oh my God, was I really in the aircraft then? You go, no, it was just a dream. You know, there's a sense of relief. Ah, it was all just a dream. What's interesting about DMT is when people come back, they don't have that sense they don't go ah oh, it was all just uh, a trip thank god for that i wasn't really facing this fearsome reptilian overlord who was about to eat my brain and then fuck me it was actually uh it was um which is not uncommon in these in these realms um it was actually real and that and that's kind of in itself remarkable this um john mack the alien abduction expert of course who put all of these alien abductees under hypnotic regression um he was also struck by this is they 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 weren't psychotic they didn't seem to have any impairment in normal reality testing um as a psychotic would as someone with schizophrenia for example uh, and yet they were 100 percent convinced this unshakable um conviction that these experiences actually happened uh, and it's a similar kind of ontological shock with DMT is that you are convinced uh, when you come back even that you have just been to a 
real place and you have interacted with real beings and received real information that you are really there in this place with these high level uh, intelligent entities so that's uh, in itself i think is is yeah, it's always struck me as another remarkable aspect of the experience is that it's not like waking up from a dream when you think you know that oh it was just a dream but actually you, you remain convinced it, it it is so um ontologically persuasive if you like the experience that it cannot be denied um is that some grand illusion that our brain is is that some great trick that our brain is uh, pulling on us we don't know but i don't think we can make that assumption um there's also deja vu of course the sense of having been there before this very profound deep sense of deja vu not just like oh you know we've all had that occasionally you get that sense of deja vu and something has happened before here this is like oh i really really have been here before this is the most bizarre place i could possibly have never imagined i couldn't possibly have imagined or conceived of you know an impossible place full of impossible geometry and yet at the same time it seems bizarrely familiar why why would some place that should be it should be the most unfamiliar place possible that there isn't a more unfamiliar realm that you could imagine than the dmt world and yet people think oh my god i've come home you know and the, the entities you know the elves will sing and cheer and bells will ring and lights will flash and say he has returned the one has returned home welcome back you know we were so uh we're so pleased to see you you know this great uproar this great celebration as you burst into this space that in is also you know why would that happen uh, again these it all ties together all of these little little pieces of the dmt state that are on their own uncanny um you know not just the experience as well also the ubiquity of this molecule this simple plant alkaloid that's everywhere uh, everywhere you look you know there are thousands of plants that contain this molecule the most common naturally occurring psychedelic it's 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 accepted by the brain uh, with great facility it's rapidly and cleanly metabolized it's like it's at home in the brain you know and just happens to produce the, it happens to efficiently switch the brain's reality it just happens to be the most effective and efficient reality switching molecule uh, that we know of and it's everywhere you know and then the experience itself these bizarre hyperdimensional geometries these intelligent entities that seem to be much more uh, advanced and sophistic technologically sophisticated than ours uh, and then the deja vu and and the sense of the ontological sense you know the sense that this, this is ontologically true this is a real place all of the, you bring it all together and you're you're faced with something that's overwhelming um you know it, it's it, it, it's something that uh, it really does overwhelm your mind and your brain and think wow can we really what the fuck is this thing you know it, uh, more than anything that i've ever um come across which is why i've devoted my life to <laughs> studying it it's um endlessly fascinating and yeah I, <laughs> I think there's a number of people who have dedicated a lot of their life to this substance and researching Absolutely, it and, yeah um, yeah, there's a whole forum endlessly populated with interesting things, the DMT Nexus and yeah. uh, a few other beautiful sites out there as well, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating. John Mack, he's a, he's a favorite of mine. Um, <clears throat> what did he say? Uh, well, I'll say the real thing first and then the joke that he made. Um, so <laughs> he used to actually deal with the abductees as if it really happened. Like that was his edge not you're delusional and we need to put you on some sort of meds to regulate you, but okay, yeah. this trauma happened. How can we help you? Um, and that was, you know, the starting point. And then uh, he said something like, um, you know, I, I tried Stan Gross holotropic breath work and it put a hole in my head that UFOs started <laughs> flying into or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so he became a really interesting alien guy. Um, and uh oh yeah and he faced a lot of he faced a lot of backlash for that um because he was a practicing clinical you know 
psychologist or psychiatrist but at Harvard of all places, right? I mean, this is where Timothy Leary was. I mean, the people would have been going, oh my God, it's happening again. Um, this time with fucking aliens. I mean, oh my God. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, you can, you can imagine these guys in their suits sitting around the table and think, what are we going to do with this guy? Um, but we need people like that. You need the mavericks. You need the people that are working at a very high level, you know, do have the training, the understanding, and the rationality um, and the intellectual sophistication um, to, to, to think about these things, to work on these things, uh, even if it means facing uh, ostracization to some extent from the academic community. Uh, and they certainly tried to do that with John Mack. Uh, but he, he, you know, he clearly saw that there was something extremely strange going on here that was unlike the delusions of, you know, he knows. Uh, I remember I saw a documentary and um, Carl Sagan, who I have mixed feelings about, but he said, oh, when Carl Sagan was asked about abduction, he said, oh, they're just hallucinating. And, and John Mack was asked about Carl Sagan's comment. And John Mack said quite rightly, you know, what the fuck does he know about hallucinations um and and that's the thing it's people that don't really know i mean carl sagan cosmologist fantastic right but he's not a psychiatrist he doesn't know he's not a neuroscientist uh john mack was uh he knows what hallucinations and delusions look like um and these alien abduction experiences whatever their true nature did not look like delusions and hallucinations and john if john mack tells you that there aren't really many other people in the world that are in a better position to advise you uh, on whether these are hallucinations or not so 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 yeah i think that's also part of the problem is that there are there are these kind of self-appointed arbiters of, of what is true and what is not true what is real and what is unreal uh, and they i won't mention any names but you can probably pull a few out of your hat um that, that they make the decisions they decide if something is too far out uh, or, or, or not, um, and which often means disregarding people who are in a much better position to argue uh, against that position, someone like um, John Mack. So, yeah, we need more John Macks. I'm not quite a John Mack, but uh, I'm doing my best with my limited Here intellectual start. resources. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, a, you know, something I want to really encourage folks to do. It's kind of, you've got to come out and start talking about these weird things. This is part of paradigm change in science. And, you know, we've got to kind of break from the boring thing we've been doing, which is okay. It was good for a while. It served us really well for a bit, but we've got to jump to this next thing, whatever that is. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. And there's, you know, you need people who are willing to spend the years going down a you know, the academic track, you know, you have to spend years of studying. As I said, you know, I spent years and years in the in, in a university system, learning several, you know, chemistry, pharmacology, neuroscience, computational neuroscience, um, before uh, I started really deeply thinking about and writing about these, these, these topics. And now I've, I've kind of, I've, I've milked the university the academic system for all for all it's got and now i've escaped which which gives me now complete freedom i can talk about what i want i can write about what i want i don't have to worry about whether my grant proposal is going to be rejected i don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the next faculty meeting uh, after they see one of my interviews on psychedelics today um i don't have to worry about that um but it, it's, it's a long this has road. happened from my university friends by the way <laughs> <laughs> really why didn't you run this by us <laughs> you know, things like that that kind of thing, right? I mean, fortunately, I, I, that's never happened to me. Um, I've only got, people have been very, very interested, even in Japan, actually, uh, um, which is another interesting topic. Uh, uh, people are very, I've never, no one's ever had a negative reaction to what I've said. Some people think I'm a bit kooky, a bit far out, a bit, a bit, a bit silly, maybe, some might think. Uh, but I've never had, you know, outright hostile uh, reactions to what I'm um, talking about, which is, which is nice to see, actually. Um, and even some really prominent science. I mean, what's his name? Um, Ralph Abraham, this chaos mathematician, who, who he, was, he did the trialogues with 
Terence McKenna, Rupert Sheldrake, and himself. I love that guy. You know, trilogues yeah. at the edge of the well. Yeah. And he wrote to me, he wrote this lovely email. He'd read Alien Information Theory, uh, which frightened me a little bit because he's like a serious mathematician, you know, pure mathematician guy. He's a bit too smart. I, yeah. A bit too smart. I thought, oh, no, he's just going to absolutely fucking tear this apart. Uh, but he didn't. He said he found it absolutely fascinating and, and, and rather convincing. Um, and he said, you know, he'd like to meet you one day. So that was great. So I thought, yes, OK, I've got Ralph Abraham on side here. Uh, so I'm getting the right people on side. It's not always successful. You can't please everybody. But then, you know, you, if you try to do that, you will you will ple- end up by pleasing nobody. So, so yeah, you have to, you have to, it, to really, I mean, a lot of people will you know, go online and onto these Reddit forums and they say, that I've, I've got a new theory. Here we go. I've got this new theory. Uh, or they will email me sometimes and say, Andrew, I have this new theory. Can I talk? Can you, can, would you, would you mind having a conversation with me? Can we have, can we Skype? Cause I've got this new theory that I think you'd like to hear about. It's like, well, I don't know you. I, I'm not just going to hop on a Skype with a random stranger to hear his, you know, his, his stoner theory. Uh, and because that's what 99% of them are, they're, they're kind of, they're, you just listen to them think this doesn't make any sense. Um, you don't have, because in, great that they're having ideas and it's, that's wonderful. But it, if, if you just let them, float off into the wind uh they're they, they're not anchored to what we we know things we do and don't know you know the basic scientific underpinnings of what if it does if you're what you're saying and your ideas don't have this basic scientific underpinning then it doesn't go anywhere it's just another idea it's just another half-baked science fiction novella uh it's not really a um a concrete model or theory or hypothesis or whatever um so i think that's kind of important we need people who are willing to go far out with their ideas but have the necessary uh training to actually anchor them uh in, into uh, you know human epistemology and human neuroscience and, and, and human pharmacology and cosmology or physics or whatever you know uh, yeah and there aren't that many there aren't that many yeah it's um it's an interesting one it's uh like it's easy to reach out to you without developing the idea first (laughs) and you know it would be amazing if people put in the work to develop the idea before starting to share it everywhere and you get taken more seriously folks (laughs) you probably yeah yeah i always say you know don't talk to me it's like people will also write to me and say oh i had these amazing experiences you know can you like, tell me what they might mean. I say, no, I can't. I don't know what your experiences mean. Write them down. Um, publish a book of your experiences. People have done that, right? That's what you need to do. Put them in writing. Um, then maybe I will read them if they're interesting. Uh, then it becomes part of this growing trip report literature, which is obviously still very, is also very important. So these are important things to do. You don't have to be a scientist to contribute uh, to this, to the to the, the unfolding understanding and discovery of this remarkable molecular technology that we have, um, just exploring, finding out new ways to explore the space. I mean, the old the old thing with the um, the e liquid, the vape pens that came out of that didn't come from Harvard or the Imperial College Psychedelic Research Group. That came from these people who are very interested in the DMT state, they were thinking about what's a more effective way, cleaner way, less harsh way of delivering DMT in a safe way. Uh, and they thought, well, what about these dissolving it in this e-liquid uh, and, and vaping it um, or using these vape um, devices used for THC, the, wax. The volcano bag? Oh, the dab rigs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, these dab rig kind of things. I Great find that idea. really a sensible option. Uh, one pull as opposed to the Terrence's uh, crack pipe, or what is that, the oil roller thing where you have to do three very big pulls at one hit. Absolutely. And it's easy to burn. It's easy to drop the pipe and uh, or the lighter and set the house on fire. Um, it tends to be the smoke tends to be vapor mixed with a bit of smoke because you're burning it a little bit and it's it's harsher. It's not as good on the lungs. You know, it's more difficult. So yes, of course, naturally, let's use a device that is 
designed for vaping um, these kind of materials. Um, so, as I said, you know, that comes out of the underground. That comes from all of these dedicated people on these forums discussing and talking about. And, and then they produce these wonderful uh, manuscripts online, the ultimate guide to vaping DMT, you know, or the e DMT e-cig manual. Great stuff. That's the kind of thing that people should be doing. You know, we're, um, I, you know, I don't have the time or the, I'm not in the position uh, to be doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but I, I love to see it. I love to see these people who don't have formal training coming out and, and genuinely producing something of huge value uh, to all of us that are interested in DMT. Have you... 5-MeO DMT, have you seen much um, of interest there related to this DMT topic? I know the experience is wildly different, um, but it's still very interesting to me. I, I don't really know what to do. It's such a different category of psychedelic that I don't really usually know what to do with it. Um, um, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, 5-MeO, it's, it's experienced something of a resurgence. I remember back in... Ooh, the 80s and 90s. Um, certainly Terence McKenna was asked about 5-MeO and he said, I don't think it's of much value. I don't think he personally had any experience with it. It didn't seem like that because he did say it didn't have any value. So he obviously never had a 5-MeO trip. Um, but yeah, it, it, it doesn't seem to, it, it, it seems to be this, my friend described it as like, you know, DMT is like the fifth dimension, whereas 5-MeO is like the 12th dimension. It, it pushes past all of the form and structure and content, uh, which is obviously what we're interested in with DMT, uh, and pushes past that into this white light, you know, of pure formless conscious awareness, um, which is very, obviously very interesting and of great value. But from, as you say, from, for completely different region reasons there aren't really it tends not to be populated as well um by entities so so people who are interested in dmt you know they will sorry in 5meo dmt we'll talk you know talk about it as the god molecule uh, and then you, you're getting into um a whole different field you it, it, it's it's into metaphysical speculation me, speculative metaphysics and philosophy you know does this represent nirvana or is this where you go after death or uh, is this the experience of the godhead directly you know is this um um shiva consciousness or something like this um so that's a whole different thing it's not something that I ha I'm an expert in it. It's, it's, it's way out of my field of expertise. Whereas with DMT, I have something. I have all of that structure, all of that content, all of those beings and all of that information uh, to, to latch onto and say, okay, there's lots of stuff to play with here. Um, let's see what we can make of it. But with 5-MeO, uh, it seems quite different. And it, that's remarkable in itself, you know, that this molecule 5-methoxy, DMT. So you add this 5-MeO group there, um, you're adding a methyl group to bufotenine, which is not interesting at all, in my opinion, as a psychedelic. And then suddenly you get this, this, this molecule that is so different to DMT, and yet in, in its own way, um, just as profound, just as fascinating, just as inexplicable, really. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's just such a rich um rich pickings for anyone who's interested in psychedelics there's so many interesting molecules and no doubt molecules that we're just waiting to be discovered um or waiting to be invented if you think about what shulgin did you know think of some of his most important discoveries think of wonderful things like 2cb um that's an invention it's a, br a molecule that didn't exist before shulgin created it and now it's like you know it's in the top 10 i would say of, of psychedelics that people like taking For um, sure. purely synthetic you know uh, and there yeah. are others as well that we can talk about but but you know that that's you know shulgin was was focusing just on the phenethylenes he started with this basic skeleton um you know with mescaline um three four five trimethoxy phenethylamine 
as being the uh, the prototypic um, uh, phenethylamine psychedelic. And they said, okay, let's modify it, manipulate it in a semi-systematic way, changing the structures, changing the, um, the the functional groups around the ring and this kind of thing, and developed, you know, I think 178 or something like that molecule some of them not interesting some of them kind of interesting some of them that have now become part of this pharmacopoeia now the, the psychedelic pharmacopoeia um, so you, you can imagine that there are many many more of these uh, and we need more shulgins as well um, certainly people who are creating these molecules because they want to explore consciously, they want to explore the mind, they want to explore what's possible with the human brain. Um, and there aren't really, you know, we don't want people in, in laboratories in China just cooking up random molecules and then shipping them off to the West as replacements for substitutes for cannabinoids. This is not, this is <laughs> Have not. Have you encountered good Dr. Stuff. Z at all in his work? No, who's he? Oh my goodness, he's somebody you need to know about. Yeah, Ezekiel. Uh, you familiar with uh, Doctor Buzz from the Jamiroquai song? He might be that guy. I hate Jamiroquai, so. Um... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll forget Can't that. Listen to his uh, music. <laughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> um, he he he's a neo shulganist is how he identifies, and uh, oh, and his primary distinction he says is uh, scale. It's a very different thing uh, to um, to do what Shulgin did than to do what he does, where he's manufacturing a lot. So he's ah. testing on him on himself. He's got a whole yeah. test network. He's got a manufacturer uh -huh. hub uh, and distribution networks. And it's like you know, fascinating because he's developed so many different things. I I don't. He's developed all sorts of novel molecules that many of which are in the. Uh, assorted markets around the world um ah, i see yeah yeah so he's kind of like made the shulgin this, visions you know? bigger mm. <laughs> it's fascinating yeah i mean that's obviously it's obviously going to happen and, mm -hmm. and a lot of this of course is driven by we what we don't want we want this to be driven by a desire to explore consciousness to explore the mind to explore what the mind is kept. That's what should be driving it. What shouldn't be driving it uh, is trying to get around drug laws because that's really what's driving a lot of it now. You know, can we develop um, new cannabinoid analogs um, that that are not controlled and then they're ne never tested properly on humans and they end up flooding the market and you create these zombie cities, um, uh, you know, these quite unpleasant, often quite toxic, Drugs. This is Leonard Picard's um, primary fear is unscrupulous chemists and operators will be doing this at, at scale. And right. It's endlessly, you know, it becomes easier every every month to create yeah. monstrous amounts of new molecules, right? As yeah, technology uh, offering goes. monstrous molecules as well, you know, monstrous amounts of quite monstrous molecules. Uh, I don't think that's healthy. I think discovery and creativity and making new molecules is important. But Shulgin wasn't making them at scale and then shipping them around uh, the United States. Other people might have done that, but that certainly wasn't his intention. He, he create he was he was an artist. He created new molecules, uh, many of them of, of, of huge value to us now. Those of us that are interested in in, in psychedelics and, and exploration of the mind and consciousness. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm very I don't like to see um, these very often. Uh, what you know as a as a chemist when you look at some of these molecules and you see it you know, these pcp derivatives you think okay we need to be careful here um there there is certainly the potential um, for um toxicity and and, and for some quite disastrous outcomes and we and we we've seen that with these cannabinoid analogs these derivatives that are not in any way really useful to anyone who's interested in psychedelics they're just used as a uh, an alternative uh, uh, to cannabis and um, I think that's that's bad but the cat is out of the bag uh, and I've actually uh, it brings me a little bit onto a slightly different topic but in terms of making novel drugs um, a couple of years ago there was a group in Europe I think it was Denmark could be wrong who actually in, who took the 
the bio, what's called the biosynthetic gene cluster. So the genes that are in the psilocybin mushroom that construct the, the psilocybin molecule from tryptophan uh, and then implanted them into yeast. Um, so what you can do then is you grow up your yeast in a sugar solution, so table sugar, sucrose, as cheap as it gets. And then this, instead of producing alcohol, uh, it produces psilocybin, or it might produce a bit of alcohol as well as psilocybin. Um, so when this technology, or when these strains, you know, it's, this can be expanded to other molecules as well. It doesn't have to be psilocybin. It could be cocaine. Um, it could be, um, you know, you name it, DMT or whatever. Uh, once this gets out, once these strains start leaking, you cannot contain them. Um, because all you have to do is grow up your yeast. You know, you mix your yeast with some water, with some sugar, leave it for a few days, and you've got a psychedelic beer of a kind. Um, and then you can you can you can filter off some of the yeast, which you've now got a lot more of because it's grown. Dry it, and you can ship it around the world. It looks like it's completely indistinguishable from normal baker's yeast that you can find in any supermarket. Once that happens. I mean, it's all the cat is already out of the bag. Then it will be really, really, really out of really, the bag. really out of the bag. You know, that yeah. that is transformative because then you can basically you can order on on a website. You can order. Okay, I'm going to get some psilocybin yeast. I'll get a little bit of. Or what do I want? Oh, I'll get a bit of cocaine yeast. And oh, for the next day, I'll get a bit of uh, morphine yeast. Yeah, uh, it's and, coming. And you can have you can have all these different beers. You know, psychedelic beers, stimulant beers, maybe mix them together, uh, and and anybody can do this at home. You know what? It, what? What? What is law enforcement going to do about that? <laughs> you know, they have completely. They've spent. It falls yeah. apart. They spent decades on their useless campaign of prohibition, um, ignoring ed- miseducation largely, largely miseducation, punishment, demonization. Yeah, they, they, they had the worst possible attitude to mind altering molecules that you could possibly have. Yeah, they spent decades doing this, billions of dollars waste, maybe probably trillions. I don't know how much the US government has spent on this and, and all Western governments and Asian governments, whatever. What happens when all of that beca- overnight almost, you know, in relative terms, you know, a couple of years, all of that becomes completely, completely then um, um, ineffective. You, you, you cannot control yeasts once they get out of this laboratory, and they will at some point, or the technology will become so straightforward that other people could in there, you know, in a, in a backyard laboratory can start doing these genetic manipulations, which aren't difficult, by the way. You know, what my PhD, I was manipulating the genes of, of bacteria and growing them up. Uh, it's not difficult to do. There's a whole technology there, you know, procedures it's quite easy did you see that cocaine was uh being manufactured in uh tobacco leaves now Uh, somebody finally did it in a plant another example of that exactly yeah i think the the yeast and bacteria scale i think better um and they're more discreet than seeds but you know what is (laughs) i i remember there being some cannabis bust in canada years ago where it was either a cbd uh you know hemp seed or or cannabis uh, with thc and they actually had to grow the seeds in the police station to get the evidence to be sure it was the right or wrong kind of seed before the court case could proceed. Fascinating. Uh. Yeah. So that that this kind of the absurdity of all the resources and energy that's been wasted on this kind of nonsense. Uh, what when that all really does become completely ineffectual, you know, hundred percent ineffectual when you get these yeasts or, or, you know, it could be plants, but as you say, you know, yeast is much more scalable, much easier to share. Um, they're, they're very stable. You know, they can, they live for a long time in a dry condition in that then it's over. I can't see a way out. The drug law has always been lost for decades, but then it's really lost. Um, it's, it's, it's easy. And, but then so has to a large extent, all of the, the black market as well. So the the cocaine, the cartels in South America, um, you know, in Colombia, whatever, 
they're not they're no longer going to have the the monopoly on this you know they're not going to be the ones growing the coca and having the coca uh, cocaine extract i find that one of the best parts the cartel falls apart yeah. and yeah the drug war just also collapses at the same time it's it's beautiful yeah and isn't that beautiful I, thing i'm spending time working for a lobby currently trying to loosen science funding for psychedelics at the federal level as a way towards rescheduling psychedelics but is technology going to beat it? I find that a big question, and there's a chance technology beats rescheduling. I think it will. Yeah, I think it, it's possible that it will. Um, it will. It will overtake and and completely supersede any any laws. Um, uh, so you have to think: Are we are we just wasting our time with with all of this? Oh, ultimately, it will all become moot. It will all become moot because anyone who wants to take cocaine or take psilocybin or take DMT or morphine uh, will just have to procure one of these, uh, a little packet of, of yeast. And then that's it. They're sorted for life then because they can, you know, you, don't, you only have to order it once. Um, you've got the packet of yeast, you grub it up and you've still got your yeast. And then you can share it. Um mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the future and it's going to happen. Like I, I can yeah. only imagine that there's kids at MIT and other technical schools doing this. So um, it's only a For matter sure. before it escapes the lab. And even if a biotech does it, I believe it'll escape the lab there too. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, or at the very least, the technology is not very hard to replicate in a black market environment. Oh, so, no, 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 not at all. And it's, and it's all published as well. You know, a lot of these... The papers are published. The techniques are standard now. They're they're completely bog standard. Introducing genes, um, exogenous genes into into yeast. That's been going on for decades. You know, uh, PhD students are doing that on a daily basis. It's not difficult, um, really. So it's just about getting the right genes into there uh, and getting them expressed properly. Um, once that is perfected, then. You know, yeah. that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. The cat is well and truly out of the bag. Game over. Right. That paired <laughs> with the dark web and some other fun things. It's yeah. Game game has been over, but yeah, it's even more yeah. over. It's even more <laughs> over. Yeah. It's really <laughs> over. <laughs> well, all right. We're at about uh, 90 minutes. So this has been a beautiful conversation. I want to kind of wrap it up, Indeed. but could you tell folks one more time about your book? And uh, I would definitely advise folks buy it. Yes, so it's called Reality Switch Technologies, Psychedelics as Tools for the Discovery and Exploration of New Worlds, Uh, the most comprehensive, detailed, deep guide to how psychedelics interface with your brain and alter the structure and dynamics of your world, up to and including switching your reality channel entirely, covering all four major classes of the psychedelics, um yeah in full color illustrated diagram beautifully designed i dare say uh throughout uh, you can see if you go to my website alieninsect.net you can actually you can have to order order the book there you can order it through amazon you can also look at you can download the first chapter including the contents for free uh, so you can see what you're uh you're getting uh and also i also have a new sub stack so alien insect uh dot sub stack dot com uh, please subscribe there i regularly write about psychedelics and psychedelic neuroscience and and also of course follow me on twitter where i regularly post alien insect again everything's alien insect basically easy to remember um and i think that covers it yes i think that's everything <laughs> <laughs> outstanding and definitely folks follow dr gallimore on twitter yeah. Yes, please. All right. And until next time, thank you for your time until here. Until then, super next fun. Time. Thank you, Joe. It's been great. <laughs>